Average Joe Travels the California Inscape. Season 8, The Wizard of Gizzards. Episode 1, Farm Macabre. Story conceived and written by Penguin Pete. Featuring the vocal stylings of This Is Signal and Penguin Pete. With Asher Ephraim as Spanky. And music by Ignore That Door. Ha <laughs> ha, that tickled my funny bone. Which is something of a relief because I wasn't sure if it was still there. So let me get this straight. The jewel thief tried to use the magic once to get away and then just shot herself in the foot instead? Oh, something like that. Just one more memory I'm drinking away tonight. Now, see, the strength card... Joe, I'll have my tarot deck back, thank you. You're driving me crazy with them. The strength card shows a fella in a big white gown holding a lion's mouth closed. That has to be a reference to the Bible story about Daniel and the den of lions in it. Right? Yeah, sure, it may well be. I'd be happy to lend you one of my doorstopper manuals on the topic when I get back to the office. I'd rather not read the book. It'd rather drive you mad. Roy, another round, buckaroo? Or are you still trying to keep up? Spanky, you're on. I'll order us another bottle of rye. (sighs) I have these two having a drinking contest on one side, and I have Joe trying to solve the ancient mysteries of 5,000-year-old cards like they were a Sunday crossword. Jack, take my cards back, will you? Now the tower card. I've seen this one before. Is that the Tower of Babel in Genesis? Or does it represent one of those Gideon knocked down with his trumpet blast? There, Joe. You see you see what too much Sunday school does to a guy? <laughs> hey, Joe, listen to this. Anne told me a verse she quotes when she was telling about the prosecution case they had. Uh, I argued the odd angle and won. Anne, Anne, what was that verse again? Mmm, Proverbs 28.1. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Anne! Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the defendant I had, the witnesses saw him duck away into shop and two cops came to the intersection. Two minutes later, he knocks out the bank. See, normal people don't shrink away from a cop. They go window shopping. They go on with their business. This guy didn't want the cops to see his face. Witness saw him do that. Bam. Premeditation. But that's the verse that uh, Ed said. Yeah, I said the jury. Now, come on, Joe. Get Bam back her cards. Come on. Before the eldritch light of ancient knowledge damned you. Fine. Here you go. I'll buy my own deck. They're a nickel a pack over at the Magic Eye. I'll put them to good use with, uh, snappy card tricks. I always wanted to build a house of tarot cards right on top of a Ouija board. Just to see what happens. I heard that a telegraph operator put his Morse key on a Ouija board and got telegrams from the spirit world. So Anne, I guess what Joe seems to be getting at, if I know my Joes, he's surprised that the affinity between Christianity and the occult exists to such a degree that a witch would quote the Bible. The Bible, and a hundred alternate versions, and the scribbled verses it's assembled from, is just one more tome of esoteric literature. Some of it occurs in other works. Some of it differs. There's even a witch in the Bible. What? Where? Was this something condemning them? Oh, far from it. She was a strategic medium. First book of Samuel. King Saul is at war with the Philistines, and he's trying to seek spiritual guidance to win. He prays and prays to the Hebrew god. No answer. He finally consults the witch of Endor to summon the ghost of the prophet Samuel. Endor? That sounds like a huge forest teeming with hunting targets. Wait, wait, wait. Did this witch actually help Saul? Well, she did what was asked of her. Saul received a vision from the ghost of Samuel, who told him, You're out of luck, Donald Duck. The Philistines mop the floor with Samuel's army. Goes to show, sometimes God doesn't answer because he hates to deliver bad news. <laughs> a freelance witch, just like you! Well, you can't sit around brewing nude stoves and bad tongue all day. You should see me hustle the tarot deck. I can turn six bucks in an hour just doing readings. So, now that I properly pickled Mr. Hill, you said something about a lead? Eh, it's just this cattle rancher out in Brightvale Acres, cows are dying. He should call a veterinarian. 
There, I solved your case already. I didn't even see him get out of his chair. Amazing. I tried the vet. They tried a dozen vets. They're all stoked. Uh, this guy's a big shot out that way. Mr. Maxwell Matic. Uh, been hurt in cattle and family business since the eight. I don't know. Their family goes back to the 1800s. Anyway, he thinks it might be witchcraft. He's. I swear he's not in that. He's just ruled out nearly everything else. Well, you can use witchcraft to kill a cow, I guess. If you don't have a plain old shotgun handy. So you're suing somebody for this guy's dead cows. If we get a name to put in a subpoena, sure. Uh, first we gotta hunt down the witch. But uh, this is a huge mess over there. There's about four or five farms all over the disputes about water rights and property. Uh, there's a pig farmer, chicken farmer, a couple of the fruit grove and a pie stand. Oh blah. Sounds as exciting as watching paint dry. If we take this, you guys handle the field interrogations while I sit this one out slinging fortunes at the office. If you find anything, then I'll come out there. Bag a brisk walk in the country air, commuting with nature would do us all a bit of good. I can smell it already. Here, let me help you off the floor, Spanky. I've been through farm country. Sounds charming until you're on the highway driving past the tenth pig wagon, with the windows rolled up, fighting to breathe. When all these guys found the complaints on each other, there's more that stinks out of the way than just the manure, believe me. A bunch of farmers with shotguns point at each other because somebody's dog got in a chicken coop. Oh, I see your point. Me and Spanky will do the field work and see who has a, uh, beef with this Mr. Matic. I bet you can milk this gig for more puns than that, Joe. Why, I could keep going until the cows came home. So, that was how Spanky and I ended up touring Brightville Acres, California, an incorporated township that was woefully lacking in infrastructure. It was unusually hot and muggy for this early Indian summer season, and the heat just made the smell from the livestock even worse. Every time we passed a truck, it was invariably carrying cows, pigs, sheep, or chickens. And in one dramatic case, all four. Maxwell Matic, the cattle rancher whose cattle kept dying instead of ranching, I guess, was too busy to meet with us. Instead, his ranch hand, Mitch, showed us around the property. It was a perfectly normal cattle ranch but a bit sprawling and with a bit more dead cows than I'm sure they hope to have there generally. After our tour with Mitch, Spanky and I set out on a walking tour of our own around the perimeter, looking for signs of recent trespassers. That took us hours in the hot, sweaty afternoon. Anne had been wise to sit this one out. She's not a country girl, or at least so she claims, and she wasn't missing a thing so far. Spanky and I decided to check the local rumor mill to get to the bottom of the witch story. Where else to visit but the local general store? It was perhaps the only retail business for miles around. I went in to chat with the proprietor while Spanky took a catnap in the car. Or considering his size, perhaps something closer to a rat nap. <laughs> Well, howdy, stranger! Just passing through? What can I get for you? Oh, nothing, thank you. Except perhaps a bit of your time. I'm in something of a nosy mood today, and I have a lot of questions to ask about the farms out this way. Right, well, I'm not too busy here. What did you want to know? Oh, local disputes, fighting over irrigation rights, controversies over who has the comeliest farm lass, Stuff of that sort. We got those, I guess, as much as any farm community. There's two main ones that are bickering. Now, Zeke Gibbons with the pig farm down in the south quarter, he don't count. He fights with everybody all the time and thinks the whole neighborhood's out to get him. Zeke Gibbons, eh? Has he made any threats around here that you know of? No, he just tries to sue everybody about everything. He picks stupid fights like somebody's dog wanders onto his property so it charges that his pig suffered emotional distress. He complains about water rights, but he complains about everything anyway. So that's Zeke. Any other quarrels brewing out here? The Matic Cattle Ranch has been in dispute with the Gumpson Orchard since forever. They've been going back and forth and back and forth in an appeals court. Both of them want more water in charge of the others using more than their fair share. 
They've been civil about it though, just keeping it professional. An orchard. That seems to be the only property not raising livestock. The Gumpsons are interesting. Married couple with their kids moved out and they ran into some kind of money windfall that let them purchase that property a few years back. They decided to go with a produce farm which is really putting a strain on our reservoir. They run a roadside stand where Mrs. Gumpson sells fruit pies. They're friendly folks, but they just don't seem to understand how we do things around here. How are you going to teach country manners to city slickers, right? Do you suppose the dispute between Mattock and the Gumpsons could lead them to harming Mr. Mattock's livestock? Oh, you mean the cows that keep dying? No, we're pretty sure that's Molly Windsor's evil eye. Molly Windsor. And what's her business? Little old widow with the small chicken farm. She has a cataract eye. Oh! white and she talks about spirits and things. She keeps to herself, just collects her eggs and sells them. She's supposed to be some kind of witch. Say, are you here with the Pinkertons? Uh, no, I'm just a private investigator. I am, in fact, in the employ of Mr. Matic. Oh, so you're going to find out what keeps happening to them cows, huh? Good luck with that, but let me tell you, detective. Don't hope to resolve too much. Nothing ever gets resolved around here. Here, people bicker with each other just to have something to do. I was just pouring myself a cup of the general store's coffee for my obligatory purchase to reward a helpful shopkeeper when all hell broke loose outside. I ran there to discover a giant pig was attacking my Packard. And Spanky as well. He was frantically honking the horn and the pig, an enormous hog almost as big as the Packard, was butting its head against the side, tipping it up on two wheels in an attempt to flip it over and thus compromise our insurance coverage. Swatting at the pig's backside did nothing to deter it. It was as if it didn't even notice me. Spanky miraculously was able to abandon the car and the pig seemed intent on him running around the dinged vehicle to get to the little leprechaun. I tried to tackle it, and its huge bulk simply knocked me to the ground. Next, as I watched, Spanky took off running with the pig in pursuit, snapping its fierce jaws at his little heels. Just as I was bracing myself for the pig to make lunch out of our little Irish friend, I heard a strange musical cue. Uh-huh, I thought. Time to wind down my narration. This is a perfect spot for a cliffhanger. Yeah! Average Joe travels the California Inscape. Season 8, The Wizard of Gizzards. Episode 2, Where the Pig Monsters Roam. Story conceived and written by Penguin Pete. Featuring the vocal stylings of This Is Signal and Penguin Pete. With Asher Ephraim as Spanky. And music by Ignore That Door. Gooder, get out in there! The apparent owner of the pig monster showed up to fire a shotgun in the air which did distract the pig enough to veer off of Spanky's six o'clock. Spanky, vexed by his several concurrent indignations, circled back to collect his hat and dust it off while I ran to catch up to them. The farmer seemed less than empathic, I don't think I've seen that word before, about Spanky's welfare and seemed even less happy to see me. What you doing on my land? Bother my hog! You got spiders in your skull? Mr. Zeke Gibbons, I presume. <laughs> Sorry to bother you, but your hog was all the way over... I asked you, you got spiders in your skull, you stuck-up little cotton-livered city slicker! Now get up with your Mexican friend and get out of here! This is my private property! 
Uh, he's not Mexican. At least I don't believe so. He is actually... Well, why don't you just barge in and invite yourself for a steaming cup of shut your mouth? I don't care if he farts or blows a tin whistle. If I catch him the rest of my hog again, he's gonna be piggy chow. We were just trying to find out who is killing Mr. Mattox cows. You gotta talk to that crazy hog north of here with that milky witch eye. Who the hell do you think is killing the cows? You just worry about you, my little willy lilies. Goodbye then. See you at church. Spanky had spent most of our conversation with Mr. Gibbons uncharacteristically silent. I believe, perhaps, he might have been impressed that a mere mortal could summon such explosive hostility, and so his silence was his form of small, hot-tempered reverence. Me, I'd spent that entire confrontation with one hand on my revolver, watching as Mr. Gibbon waved his shotgun around. I don't care who done it, let's just frame him for it and call it a day. Having that man sent away will do this community a world of good. That hog left hoofprints on the windows and looks like he dented the door. Sheesh, that thing was a monster. I mean the pig, but Zeke too. Did you stand down wind of him then? Never met somebody who could stand next to a pig and smell worse. How do you think I feel out here? I have a psychic nose from a Wendigo encounter. I get to smell everything five minutes before you do and enjoy the mixed bouquet of it mingling with my current smell. An experience that I'm not sure how to properly describe. But let's not be too hasty framing Zeke. We haven't met everybody in this neighborhood yet, and he might just be with the Visitor's Bureau. What does our witness suspect scorecard say? Between the general store clerk and Mr. Mattox's cowboy Mitch, plus the opinion of the pig boy, Molly Windsor at the chicken farm is a witch. We ought to at least pop by. Pig boy? If a cowboy tends cows, then a pig boy tends pigs. Swell. Then let's go meet the chicken girl. <coughs> the widow Windsor was not only alliterative, but also almost a rhyming micro couplet. And she had the most humble property in town. Just a few rickety chicken coops, some fence, and a ramshackle ranch house dressing. And a ramshackle ranch house. It didn't take us long to ascertain that the chicken girl was not home. I walked around the cottage periphery, peeking into the windows, and Spanky stood on my shoulders to spring up onto the roof for a peek into the attic windows. After he saw what he saw, and I saw what I saw, we figured that there was probably a very good reason to call Anne after all. So let me get this down for Anne. We saw a stuffed goat head, black wax candles, some kind of altar or shrine. I think I saw a painting of old scratch on the wall. I think what that was was a shralter. And she has bins of mushrooms growing in the kitchen. And could identify them. What luck to have a botanist on the team. Say, I heard you once accidentally mistook Anne's herbal tea blend for coffee and drank it. What was it like? Like lying flat on my back on the floor for about two hours seeing stars through the ceiling. She claims that potation sharpens her magic energy, but only if you build up tolerance for it first. It's my considered opinion, and keep this to yourself, Spanky, that she just runs around high as a kite. Mm-hmm. Give me a nip off that flask of scotch you carry around. Let's find a payphone. <laughs> Ye old faithful General Store in town had a pay telephone. Anne agreed that she'd better come see for herself. Oh, darn. And here me and Starwing planned a girl's night out tonight if you didn't need me. But you're right, it does sound like Miss Windsor is practicing something. Are the mushrooms red caps with little white spots by chance? Amanita muscaria? Uh, no, they're kind of brownish. Hmm, dark, tawny brownish with white spots like the regalia? Light golden brown like gallerinas? Do the stems look like they taint blue? And I'm not going to try to identify mushroom species over a telephone. Well, we shouldn't jump to conclusions if she's just trying to make something like Lion's Mane for her memory. Under her stuffed goat's head and portrait of Satan? Oh, 
Right. I'll come right over. I shudder to think what the cab fare is to Brightville Acres, though. Lucretia offered to send me her limo to give me a lift. She worries about me when I'm in town on my own. I'll be there in a few hours. Now that's what I call service. Spanky and I grabbed lunch at the general store, which had a small lunch counter where the proprietor served cold-cut sandwiches. We also listened to the store clerk tell us more about the Windsor Farm. Oklahoma transplants from long ago, Mr. Windsor died under mysterious circumstances, and apparently Mrs. Windsor's evil eye was capable of making all the milk go sour at last year's county fair. One item nagged me about Mrs. Windsor. Nobody had mentioned animosity between Windsor and Mattick. The Gumpson Fruit Orchard had quarreled with the Matic Ranch, and of course, Zeke and his giant hog were everybody's enemy by all accounts, but what motive could Mrs. Windsor have? Besides the witch rumors, the only other reason to suspect her was that her property was closest to the Matic Ranch, right across the country highway. After finishing lunch, Spanky and I amused ourselves by browsing the store's comic racks. The general store was right in the center of town, so it made sense for us to wait for Anne there. I was just catching up with the latest adventures of Slam Bradley chasing down Ching Lung in Detective Comics when behind me... One day, the magic will end. Who said, Who said that? that? Why, I'm Gomer Bean, because that's what I was yesterday. Please, tell me more about this magic. The bad magic and the bad plants that kills all of Mr. Matt-Doc's cows. That bad magic will end someday. I think we found the village idiot. Now, hold on a moment, young fellow. What's this about bad plants? The mushrooms that grow in Mrs. Windsor's window. Them mushrooms... Kills the cows when you give them some. Hold on, you mean Mrs. Windsor's just killing the cows with poison? Boring. Oh no, she don't know nothing about it. But I try to share with cows when I have some. Uh, magic mushrooms, they make you have funny dreams. But I guess too much magic kills cows. What? You're just feeding these mushrooms to the cows? What kind are they? I don't know nothing about no kind of mushroom. You gotta get yourself a mushroom book and study it until you learned it all up. Well, that wraps up the case. I always wanted someone to just up and confess. With the general store clerk as a witness, we telephoned Brightville Acres local constable to take one Gomer Bean into custody. We told them what we knew and assured them we had a, uh, mycology... <laughs> and assured them we had a mycology expert already on the way to help in identification of the mushrooms. But wait a minute. Mr. Mattox Cowboy Mitch, is there another Cowboy Mitch? Had mentioned that the veterinarians were stumped having examined the cows. Surely they must have known to check for poison. Who knows, maybe they can't test for mushrooms. But you know, I feel it too. This case seems like it is over too quickly. Indeed. A little too, too quickly. I suspect that we're not even halfway through this case. Average Joe travels the California Inscape. Season 8, The Wizard of Gizzards. Episode 3, Brightville Acres Ain't No Place to Be. Story conceived by Penguin Pete. Written by Dodge Zelko. Featuring the vocal stylings of This Is Signal. With Asher Ephraim as Spanky and Ian Patton as Mr. Mattox Cowboy Mitch. And music by Ignore That Door. Anne was late in reaching Brightville Acres on account of heavy traffic tied to a Miss San Andreas fault line beauty pageant. So, Spanky and I sat around the portico of the general store, nipping a bottle of red eye and teasing a bedraggled mule with some card tricks. 
The shopkeeper serenaded us with his instrument of choice. All at once, I mean in simultaneity, we noticed a dust cloud mounting in the distance. It heralded the arrival of a stretch limousine, and in a town with a population of, let me consult my notes, twelve people, I was sure this would draw notice and lead to some spurious conclusions about our status in the world. As soon as she lowered her window, I shared my concerns with Anne. She looked up at me impassively, or I think impassively, as she was wearing sunglasses and her mouth was obscured by a tall martini. Yes, yes, Joe, I've taken care of it. We're not staying here. We're bedding down one town over, a little charming place called Claremore. You'll be pleased. Everyone there is quite musically inclined. My ears aren't much for harmonica, though. Dreadful instrument. If you could kindly come aboard, I've had a long, tiresome commute. We waved farewell to the shopkeeper and the credulous donkey. Then Spanky and I, for all of three minutes, enjoyed the leather-padded luxury of Lucretia's limousine. This was as long as it took the driver, whose face I never quite glimpsed, to pull up to a spitting likeness of the general store we had just left. Only this establishment had a large wooden sign hung on chains that read, Hotel. Seated out front was a familiar gentleman, plucking a banjo. Well, howdy! Steady on. You haven't happened to have a twin, do you? One town over, knows his way around a harmonica. No, sir. I run this here hotel, too, alongside the old Brightvale General Store. Couldn't help but overhear that you folks were headed this way and that the lady wasn't taken to my tin sandwich. So, I reckoned I better rush over and be hospitable, if you follow me. Apparently, we had. Followed him. But how did... when did... Spanky, Joseph, be a couple of darlings and help me with this luggage. Once we were installed by the county's most expedient entrepreneur into a pair of adjacent suites, the three of us turned in. The rooms were identical in every way. There were horseshoes over the doorways, longhorns over the headboards, and headshoes over the horse longs. There was, regrettably, only one bed and I quickly became amazed at how so small a body could occupy so much space. I awoke early, mere seconds before the neighborhood rooster, with one of my legs dangling off the mattress. Spanky was sprawled out like a starfish, muttering in his sleep. I ain't signing this without me, lawyer. A Jack Hill. A lo- look him up, or lick ours. Tosser. <laughs> Guy, Skyler for your ma! Joe, Spanky, are you decent? We've received the telegram. Having slept in such close quarters, Spanky and I were decidedly decent, and so told her to enter. As Spanky came down from his cardiac event, Anne unfolded a piece of paper and read to us a formal invitation from the Gumpsons to breakfast at their home. Why, that's awfully decent of them. It'll be nice to get together with the Gumpsons. Remind me, who are they? They're the orchard keepers, the city slickers, the ones the Matlocks are in a heated dispute with. They're what they'd call the key players, Joe. Do forgive me, I haven't had any coffee. With the promise of a home-cooked meal to look forward to, we made ourselves presentable. Rusty brown water screamed from the showerhead, scouring our every cleft and cranny like a deranged washerwoman armed with a pad of steel wool. Poor Spanky, supple fellow that he was, came out looking thrashed and rashed from head to toe. I thought I had better dip down to the lobby and ask about a telephone. I wanted to check in with Mitch, the cowhand, or better yet, Mr. Matic himself if he were available, 
and relate the strange confession we had received last night from Gomer Bean about him feeding mushrooms to the cows. As I had expected, it was Mitch on the other end of the line. <laughs> I appreciate you following up on every lead, but old Gomer, God bless him, he's got more chuckles in his head than a jack-in-the-box. I see. Yeah, I heard you set the law on him. Waste of time if you ask me, begging your pardon. All I mean is while he was in custody, I'd say he was pretty well exonerated. Exonerated? Yes, sir. Vindicated. Discharged. Damned if we didn't have three more cows keel over last night, while Mr. Bean was behind bars. I heard the cowhand hawk a dispirited gob into a nearby spittoon. It pealed as prettily as a church bell. Three more cows. Well, I'll be. Funny. That's just what I said. This is where I envisioned myself. Even back in the trenches of Wall Street. Living off the fat of the land. Enjoying God's rich green bounty. Some people get so invested in the rat race, they forget that's what it is. They bypass their cheese and keep running. Well, not me. I've put my proverbial cheddar to good use. Bought a few acres far from New York, that den of iniquity in which to till the honest earth. Pass the bangers, please, Miss Martha. Stocks are a modern marvel, yes. But at what cost? I wouldn't call them altogether spiritually edifying. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. The what? They are a tool. Money is a tool. And I was lucky enough, savvy enough, if I may say so, to cash in my chips when I did. A platter of snags there, love. Sling it on over to Spanky. As the economy went under, my patented algorithm afforded me dispensation from the unprecedented penury which befell my fellow countrymen. Yourselves included, I'm sure. He means the sausages. Spanky, use plain English. Surely you're keen to hear the specifics of how I made out. Well, it's quite technical, I'm afraid. I am using the bloody queen's English, and pray tell who be plainer than she. Ooh, the sausages, of course. Here, Mr. McDungle, take as many as you like. A simple matter of collating averages, standard deviations, applying trends and recurrences to modern market sentiments. It's all right there in the newspapers, if you know how to read them. Miss Darkside, I must say, it's quite progressive of your husband to permit you to gallivant off to the far corners with these two gentlemen here. You must have a very secure marriage. Oh, he's a right keeper, old Barnaby is. Happy to be free of our cooking, probably. You see, Mrs. Darkside here is nowhere near as accomplished in the kitchen as yourself, Martha. I call you Martha. Oh, but surely you jest. But if you like, Miss Darkside, I would be all too happy to share some of my recipe cards with you. Lord knows I have enough for them to satisfy the pickiest husband. Which fortunately is not mine. Except for Fenugreek. He doesn't care at all for Fenugreek. Barnaby Darkside adores fenugreek. Eats it by the shovelful, he does. Joe, we've taken up enough of these nice people's time and eaten their nice food. Don't you think we should attend to business and be on our way? That's right. We were originally discussing the matics, weren't we? Forgive my wandering mind. I have nothing but respect for my dear neighbors, whether or not the feeling is mutual. I suppose to them, we must seem out of our element. I know there have been some hard feelings regarding our water usage, our beneficent employment of migrant field hands, but that's the orchard business for you. I can't help it if we're surrounded by cattle ranchers. It's an apples and oranges comparison. Apples and pegs, more like. That Zeke Gibbons, he could do with some etiquette schooling. Needs a straight-shouldered lassie like you, Martha, to teach him how civilized folk behave. Well, heavens. Aren't you just a little charmer? Ahem. <clears throat> well, Mr. and Mrs. Gumson, I think I speak for my colleagues when I say this breakfast has been spiritually edifying. 
Please forgive us the intrusion and for dining and dashing as well. But we are here to solve a case, and we had better get to it. Indeed. All work and no play. Doesn't that bring back memories? Shouting bids on the trading floor from dusk until dawn. The ticker tape parades of 27 coinciding with my first promotion. Shaking the hand of no less a personage than Richard Whitney at a snooker tournament on the Lower East Side. Dick Whitney, you don't say. Ah, yes. The stories I could tell. A ribald man, to be sure, and not especially fond of fenugreek himself. Or any Greek, for that matter. In all my years as a private investigator, even as a soldier, I had never been more eager to extract myself from a compromised situation. The air outside smelled sweeter, pickled with pig, what have you, though it was. I could at last hear myself think. Blasting Carmen over breakfast. Is that an Eastern custom? If it is, remind me to never again pry into Eastern customs. Well, Spanky had himself a lovely time. That Martha. Woo! Now there's a woman for you. You're terrible, Spanky. I wanted to throttle you in there. In fact, I still do. And what would old Barnaby have to say about that? Don't get scundered just because he can't roll a blintz half as well as Mrs. Gumpson can. Can we be sure we weren't rolled by migrants? Well, should we head next door to the Mattics and inspect their three latest casual... <laughs> their three latest casualties? No, not just yet. Take me to the witch. What's handy about a town this size is that everything is in walking distance. What is not handy about it could fill the entire space of the town. But, that said, we only had to hoof it a quarter mile to reach Molly Windsor's cottage, with its gap tooth fence and tumble-down coops, its squeaky weather vane, and its overall air of chickeny diabolism. This time, the emaciated old slattern, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, was there to receive us. Only the thing was, she quite reminded me of my grandmother, God rest her soul. Sweet and guileless, far from slatternly. I told you I wouldn't say that. In fact, plump as a cherub, rosy-cheeked and winsome in her fluffy pink bathrobe. She showed us inside, offered us tea and cookies, I was much more at ease here than I'd been at the Gumpsons. But such is the trickery of a witch. I know of what I speak. I decided I had better stay extra vigilant. No tea for me, Ms. Windsor. I never drink on the job. I'm afraid we're here on rather severe business. Homicide. No, it's not. What's Latin for cow? Whispers of some occult maniac running around, hexing Brightvale out of all its heifers. But I suppose you wouldn't know anything about that, would you? Spanky took my cue. He puffed out his chest and cracked his wee knuckles, fixing the Windsor Harridan with a beady eye. I see Dodge has found a thesaurus. Please take a seat. Take whatever strikes your fancy. As you see, I have quite an assortment. Wednesdays are my baking days. There's shortbread, gingerbread, marzipan, molasses. Oh, cut the shite, Molly. The jig is up. And if there's one thing I know, it's a jig. I see a jig, and I know a jig. And when I walked in here, the first thing I smelt was a jig. You've been getting jiggy, Molly. The whole town's talking about it. You may as well fess up before you dig yourself in deeper. Ah. Uh... Fellas? Goodness me. I haven't the faintest idea. You want to throw the pipe and hot tea in your eye? Eh? Do you now, bustle butt? Well, I never. If I could have a private word with you gentlemen, please excuse us, Miss Windsor. We'll be just a moment. Spanky and I exchanged looks. 
shrugged and joined Anne over by the demonic shrine we had glimpsed yesterday through the window. I admit, it didn't exude half as much malignancy as I might have expected. We have a problem. These are not poisonous mushrooms, and to my knowledge they do not possess any magical properties. They're called turkey balls, and they're delicious. Turkey what? As for the goat's head, an exemplary piece of taxidermy. Look at the artisan's card still attached to the piece of twine. If that's art, then we made Fergus down at the abattoir. He's a right Michelangelo. And the painting of Satan. You two really disappoint me. Notice the flute. It's clearly the Greek god Pan. That was painted by my daughter. Isn't she gifted? She's a beekeeper, too. Made me those nice black candles. Quiet, you. Stay back and keep your hands out of that bloody apron where we can see them. Speaking of bloody Anne, how do you explain the sacrificial altar, hmm? Just a cutting board, is it? Just doing a bit of, like, cooking, is she? Making a nice stew with these turkey tongues? Well, why not? Look, here's some sage, garlic, a pepper mill. Have you ever heard of the dark arts requiring a pepper mill? Could be anything in there. Could be baby's bones. No disrespect, but I'm not sure you're seeing the forest for the trees, being a witch yourself and all. You best let me and Joe handle this. I hate to say it, but we may have rushed to judgment on this one. You two have persecuted this old widow enough. This is a dead end. I'd bet my professional reputation on it. Oh, blimey. I guess tea and biscuits are off the table then, ain't it? Lavishing poor Molly Windsor with our deepest apologies, we beat a sheepish retreat back to the center of town where I bought a pack of smokes and a newspaper and tried to clear my head. Spanky was playing peekaboo with our old friend the bedraggled donkey. Anne went off to place a telepathic call to Lucretia and solicit her advice. I think she may have been losing faith in her longtime business partner's prowess, for which, at this time, I couldn't exactly blame her. Right there, on the front page of the local gazette, was a pertinent story about the Matic vs. Gumpson lawsuit. The plaintiff was maintaining that the coming and going of migrant workers to and from, as comers and goers go, the Gumpson Orchard, in conjunction with excessive water use, added up to, quote, a detrimental nuisance and that the Mattox cattle, as a result, were suffering. I did not quite see how the Gumpson's arrogance and exploitation begat dead cows. Not yet, but it did get me thinking. I ran my thoughts by Anne when she ended her, uh, call. If the Gumpsons are really being so wasteful, drawing that much water, then where does all the runoff go? You're suggesting we spend the afternoon doing what? Sniffing around dams and ditches? Okay, fine. Whatever keeps you two from accosting more grannies is an acceptable plan to me. Speaking of which, where is that little bruiser gone anyway? (laughs) So, with myself undergoing a long, dark night of the soul and Spanky nursing a hoofprint below his right eye, we wended back to the property line between plaintiff and defendant, Matic and Gumpson. Twilight purpled the sky. Soon we would be forced to recess. We came to a two-stage drainage ditch. It held no water at present, but was muddy underfoot and crawling with plant growth. We followed it to the mouth of a cavernous culvert that disappeared into a hillside. The air inside the culvert seemed inky blue. Nearby, an owl hooted. Dry leaves rustled in the wind. I lit a Lucky from my fresh pack and kept the lighter burning. It guided our way through the culvert, which began branching out into a labyrinth of slimy subterranean sluices, like the root system of some ancient tree. Joe, I've got a bad feeling about this. In saying this, she was giving voice to what my nose was telling me. That we had better turn back, lest we meet the same fate as those two tardy unicorns booked in steerage on a certain ark. 
The metal walls of the tunnel were trembling. A far-off white noise quickly escalated into a thunderous roar of white rapids. We ran, knowing it was fruitless. A peculiar sensation to be cartwheeled off your feet, flushed like an unmentionable into the spiraling bowels of the netherworld. I half expected to wash up at the sandaled feet of Hades, or Poseidon, or perhaps somewhere around Sausalito. Any of those would have been preferable to our actual destination. <coughs> Behind enemy lines on the pig-infested property of one Zeke Gibbons. Average Joe travels the California Inscape. Season 8, The Wizard of Gizzards. Episode 4, Live in La Cerda Loca. Story conceived by Penguin Pete. Written by Jimmy Luego. Featuring the vocal stylings of This Is Signal, with Asher Ephraim as Spanky, and Ian Patton as Mr. Mattox Cowboy Mitch, and music by Ignore That Door. Only once before had I felt this keen a sensation of imminent doom. Not when I braved demons and fire during Anne's hunt for a Templar chastity belt. Not when I was mauled by a demon goose. Not even when my hometown was overrun with cultists and unearthly pumpkining. It was just after uttering an awkward I do in City Hall beside my first, and only, wife. Granted, the hum of passers-by was a nicer chorus than the death pigs I was presently hearing, but in hindsight... A good I got some nice tasty horses for ya! Get it, boys! Happily distracted from my ill-timed reminiscence, I took stock of the current menace standing altogether too near Spanky and me. There was Zeke, eyes flaming with a pitchfork in one hand and shotgun in the other, and around him a swarm of snarling swine. I reflectively reached for my pistol, but, like the rest of me, it was soaked through. Spanky espied my troubled expression, and then the surrounding beasts. I've got a bad feeling about this, Joe. Funny, that's just what Anne said before something terrible happened. Let's book it, Spanky. To the horrible cries of Sue and the accompanying hungry grunts, we turned tail down the only passage we could find which did not lead to Piggy Doom. Crushing terror forced us forward, and not even the realization that my fresh pack of luckies was irreparably soaked slowed me down. It's too dark! Oi, watch where you're fleeing! Apologies, Spanky, but I'm somewhat out of sorts at the moment. Don't you have your stone on you? Who knows what terrors lurk ahead. I heard my small companion briefly rifle through his sodden clothes, eventually emitting a satisfied aha. Then, with a breathless incantation, I saw that his magical stone was indeed upon his person, and coming from a superior manufacturer than my generally reliable Calibri, proved its arcane powers of illumination. Being more than a head taller than my companion, I was quick to notice an ominous black void immediately ahead of the sprinting leprechaun. Watch out, Spanky. There's a... <coughs> Too late for him. I barely managed to hop over the trap before considering it would be poor form to abandon an employee to such a pit to full fate. A moment's pause was enough for me to brace for the plunge myself. Geronimo! Overhead, in the undefined distance, at least we hoped it was distance, we could hear the echoing cries of swine. Of Zeke Gibbons, we heard nothing. Spanky's stone was still shining strong, and once we had staggered to our feet, we took in our surroundings. Saints and demons, where are we? Your guess is as good as mine. 
Obviously, we won't be heading back the way we came. But, unless I'm much mistaken, this is a concrete floor. This suggests we are in a room. And if I've learned anything from a decade of detective work, most rooms have doors. Spanky passed the stone's light beam around the chamber, settling its illumination upon a steel portal on the far side. We quickly muttered our prayers and strode over. It opened on the first twist of the knob, and for the first time that day, it appeared our luck might not be quite run out. After you, boss. Spanky, you've got our only source of light. I'm not going to fumble into evil darkness while you hang back. Fine, here you go. I had hoped he would boldly take the lead, but no. He tossed me the rock and immediately positioned himself safely behind my larger frame. Sighing quietly, I took the first step into the unknown. We were greeted by a fetid breeze, which, despite its stench, relieved me considerably. The moving air suggested a much larger area, perhaps with room to maneuver. I took comfort also from the fact that a whiff of my sniffer gave no hint of blood, pig, or, worse still, Zeke. Tracing the sense in the comparative dark, I also detected something very unlikely. A woman's perfume. Anne's perfume, to be precise. She was nearby, or soon would be, and had either not received so nearly thorough a soaking as Spanky and me, or had grown too liberal in her application of scent. My surging optimism? No. My slightly lessening sensation of doom urged me to feel around outside the door frame. Luck continued its wild ride with us as I felt a lever. This should shed some light on things. I flipped the switch and immediately regretted the decision. Sizzling sodium lights burst into life, casting searing beams of yellow luminescence, which in turn formed jagged shadows over all manner of diabolical machinery. The hum of electricity was palpable, and I realized too late that bringing our location to the attention of Zeke and his porcine posse may not have been the best idea. Oh, Joe. <laughs> you idiot. It's good to see you too, Anne. Tell me, what's a classy lady like yourself doing here? And how did you come by a set of dry clothes? I tossed Spanky his stone. Upon catching it, he began exploring the maze of razored wonders that surrounded us like a fiendish playground. I was in no rush to ruin my dress, much less drown in a rush of ditch water. I was minutes behind you in the tunnel arriving just in time to witness your valiant escape from Zeke Gibbons and his herd. Hey, Anne, look at me! I'm on a slide! Whee! <laughs> a brief glance upward, and we saw that our friend was playing around in what was, quite obviously to Anne and me, a vast processing mechanism with sluices, hook rails, conveyors, and, yes, a gleaming metal ramp which Spanky only barely jumped off of before slicing his wee body into even weir pieces. He landed in what would have been an appreciably graceful manner, had it not been right in the middle of assorted <coughs> innards. Goodness, that's quite a lot of awful all over. I wouldn't expect the likes of Mr. Gibbons to maintain the exacting standards demanded by the good folks at the FDA, but just what is he hoping to do with all this... goo? Judging from the candles I found in the side room earlier, as well as some sickening stone and flesh piles I saw nearby, I'm guessing that Zeke has been feeding some hungry, hungry demons. Well, isn't that civil of him? Not quite, Joe. The candles, the shrines... The mounds and mounds of guts. He's obviously practicing Santeria. Heaven knows how he got wind of it. Allowing lesser demons, Oricha, in case you were wondering, Joe. To be honest, I wasn't. But thank you, anyhow. To feed and return for favors. It's like we were discussing with Jack and Roy at dinner before this disgusting case. 
Different religion, different names, same kinds of practices, rites, and ingredients. How sickeningly edifying. Listen, you two. I can't help but think that standing around discussing the finer points of bloody ceremony isn't the best use of our time right now. All right, my poor little brothers, get those trespassing carpet manners. An alarming call to the present, if ever I had heard one. But why hadn't my nose tipped me off about the impending assault? I took a quick glance around as Anne pulled out a wand, and Spanky took an impressively square-jawed fighting stance. A click in the distance echoed softly down the cavernous room, followed by a slow whirring build and the holler of swiney battle cries. Casting a massive shadow from above, I saw the ill form of Zeke Gibbons, who was laughing maniacally as his horrible machine came to life. The pigs advanced with odorful menace. Well, mates, it's been good knowing you. Let's show these piggies what for. <sighs> Not how I thought I'd end my days, but I'm going to make as much crispy bacon out of these animals before meeting Anubis. Anubis? Something wasn't sitting right with me. Correction. Something wasn't smelling right. All through our conversation, I had kept part of my mind on my nose. I hadn't smelled the pigs before, nor did I smell them now. In fact, I could smell the outdoors. Damp gravel and dirt, to be precise. Hold on. They held, giving me looks that sent my mind and eyes racing, scouring the yellow-lit crannies and far walls. And there it was. A door. A door I had ignored. Follow me, team. I hoofed it to the far side of the death factory with a slightly confused Anne and Spanky right behind me. The grunts toppled down toward us, and Zeke, who saw I'd seen what I'd seen, emitted a surly growl before taking pot shots at us with his weapon. Reaching what I prayed to be the exit, I bashed bodily into the barrier, smashing the door forward and nearly ripping it off its hinges. A corridor, a flight of stairs, a corridor, a turn, another flight of stairs, and then a gate. Spanky immediately slid to one of the handles by the floor. I grasped the other, and with a mighty heave, we rattled it high enough to slip under and into the great outdoors. Anne was mindful enough to slam it back down behind us, just in time to stop the ravenous monsters dead in their tracks. We sprinted to the road, then from the road to the hotel. Well, howdy! What can I do you for? I managed a friendly wave and breathlessly strode past the kindly clerk to the payphone, immediately dialing the station where we had sent Mr. Bean off to the previous day. Good afternoon, Constable. Please, take me on my word, but we need you to send whoever is available to the Claremore Hotel. Thank you very kindly. Just what is going on, Joe? Aye, the swarm of deadly pigs is well locked in their master's grounds, and there's no way a copper's gonna believe a cock and bull story about Santa Rio. Running for your life from a posse of furious boars is a marvelous way to clear the mind, cutting out a path for some powerful deduction. Get to the point, Joe. And it had better be a good one. All I've seen from the two of you since I got here is bad flirtation and misplaced postulation. It's elementary, my dear dark side. The astronomical water usage, the migrant labor, there's more to that orchard than meets the eye. I admit that I was not entirely certain where I was going with this, but for the time being, Anne and Spanky gave me the benefit of the doubt. While waiting on the municipal reinforcements, we had some coffee and Spanky and I did our best to dry our clothes as we huddled by a cast-iron stove which dominated much of the lobby. Huh. You know there's nothing actually burning in that, right? Hush, Anne, hush. Now there's a good girl. You just let Joe and Spanky be. Hmm, back to that, eh? A few officers arrived just as Anne was mustering what would have assuredly been a withering put-down. 
I explained our situation, describing our culvert encounter in the broadest terms, and we all zipped over to the Gumpson estate. After the unpleasant breakfast earlier that morning, it was with considerable relish that I observed Mr. Gumpson's veneer collapse into panic. What might have worked out as a mere friendly visit from the policia quickly became an impromptu raid, as Mr. Gumpson fled from his front door, giving the officers an excuse to scour the property. What they found was amazing. Cannabis. Acres of the stuff. All tended by monoglot migrants. I volunteered translation as best I could, and we learned that the Gumpsons had been growing jolly green for some time. Pouring sweat and in the hands of one of Claremont County's finest, Gumpson admitted that they had indeed been spending some efforts to cut off their neighbor's water supply in order to expand the operation. With hundreds of pounds of evidence and about as thorough a confession as any copper could hope for, Mr. and Mrs. Gumpson, along with the harvesters, were carted off to justice. Spanky will wait for you, Martha! Oh, shush. Serves those two right. It's too bad about the field hands, though. With a little luck, they'll just be packed off to where they came from. I suspect that the local authorities would just as soon not suffer the paperwork. And Spanky and I squished ourselves into the rear seat of a police cruiser, and we were taken back to our hotel. Well, all's well that ends well. Say, anyone else hungry for some ribs? Ends well indeed. Litigation, obfuscation, and terror tactics would test the will of anyone, even if they are a hardened cattle rancher. Mr. Mattick should rest easy now. I should hope so. Lawyers and opera are bad enough. It burns me up they'd stoop to killing those poor cows. Somewhat exhausted from our escapades, we bid each other a good night after a wordless meal at the hotel's one dining table. The next morning, I again awoke before the rooster crow, dressing quickly and slipping down to the lobby to check in with Mr. Mattick's cowboy Mitch. Well, if it ain't the unofficial arm of the law, you've been busy, Mr. Joe. All in a day's work. Unfortunately, so has someone else. Doing my rounds this morning, wouldn't you know I found four more from the herd in a state of eternal repose. <laughs> You don't mean... Yes, sir. Something's still rotten in the county of Brightvale. 